comment from the senator from South Dakota. And by the way, could I just mention, I, I don't quite seen anything uh, on the floor of the Senate as I saw the senator from South Dakota challenged earlier today. I was watching proceedings on the floor. Uh, I wonder if the senator from South Dakota would like to maybe respond to really uh, accusations of uh, misleading information, uh, I guess is the kindest way I could describe it. Well, I appreciate the senator from Arizona yielding. I appreciate the discussion of all our colleagues on the floor here this evening who are pointing out not only how flawed this process is and that it's being conducted behind closed doors in contradiction of all the promises and the commitments were made, that this is going to be a transparent, open process. Uh, the senator from Arizona has, has been great at, uh, I think, holding uh, the other side accountable when it comes to these, uh, all these pronouncements about how this is going to be an open and transparent process. Clearly, that's not the case. There's something going on right now that, uh, that we're not uh, privy to, and I think at some point they're going to throw something, as the senator from Arizona said, at the wall, hoping that this latest thing will stick. But I do want to make uh, one observation uh, with regard to, to the discussion that's been held earlier today, because uh, someone, a member of the other side, senator from Minnesota, had indicated that he thought that this chart was somehow uh, inaccurate or misleading. And I want to point out again, Madam President, uh, that the chart is, uh, is very accurate. In fact, the taxes in the bill begin 18 days from now on January 1st of next year. January 1 of 2010 is when the taxes under this bill begin. And in fact, almost $72 billion of taxes will have been collected before the benefits that start to kick in will be paid out. The, the premium subsidies that are going to support uh, the exchanges that are supposedly going to help those who, uh, who don't have insurance uh, get access to it. That's 1,479 days from now. Now, what the, uh, the senator from Minnesota got up and said is he said, and I quote, we are entitled to our own opinions. We're not entitled to our own facts. The facts is benefits kick in on day one, and the large majority of benefits kick in on day one. I'm sorry, kick in on day one, and we shouldn't be standing up here with charts that say the exact opposite. Well, Madam President, it's not me saying this. It's the Congressional Budget Office. The Congressional Budget Office has said that 99% of the coverage spending in this bill doesn't kick in until January 1 of 2014 or 1,479 days from here. Now, I say to my colleagues and to most Americans around this country, do you think it's fair to construct a bill that, in order to understate its total cost, starts raising taxes in 18 days, but doesn't start delivering 99% of the coverage benefits until 1,479 days from here. Now, if the other side wants to have an argument about whether 99% of the coverage benefits kick in in the year, in, uh, the year 2014, or 100%, I'm happy to have that argument. The point is simply this. Taxes start 18 days from now. Tax increases. $72 billion in taxes will have been imposed upon the American people, and the benefits 1,479 days from now. So, Madam President, I want to make that point and, uh, and refute the argument that was made by the Senator from Minnesota that a large majority of benefits kick in on day one. 99% of the benefits don't kick in until later. Now, incidentally, I have an amendment uh, that I hope we get a chance to vote on that will delay the tax increases as, until such time as the benefits begin. We think it's only fair to the American people that we synchronize the tax increases with the benefits. Now, many of us don't support the tax increases in the first places, which was why we'll be supporting the Crapel Amendment tomorrow to recommit the tax increases back to the committee and, and hopefully get rid of them. But if you're going to have tax increases and you're going to start raising revenue immediately, then you ought to start paying out the benefits at the same time, or at least delay the tax increases so that the benefits and the tax increases are synchronized. That, to me, seems like a fair way to conduct and to, and to do public policy for the American people. Uh, that, this clearly isn't the case. And the reason it was done this way, Madam President, let's be honest about it, and the newspapers have made it pretty clear that uh, in some of the statements that they've made, the Washington Post, the measure's effective date was also pushed back by one year to 2014. That projection represents the biggest cost savings of any legislation to come before the House or Senate this year, but the measure's effective date was also pushed back. They keep pushing the date back to understate the cost. The reason they want to start collecting revenue right away and not start spending until later is because they know that if they start <laughs> the spending earlier on, they're going to start inflating 
significantly the cost of this thing, and the goal was to try and keep it under a trillion dollars. We all know now, and they've acknowledged, that the 10-year fully implemented cost of this isn't $1 trillion, it's $2.5 trillion. The American people deserve to know the facts. That's the fully implemented cost. And the only reason that they can say that in the first 10 years it comes in at a $1 trillion or thereabouts is because the tax increases start January 1 of 2010, and the benefits, 99% of the benefits, don't start kicking in until January 1 of 2014. So I thank the Senator from Arizona for giving me the opportunity to clarify that. It is important that we make this debate about the facts. I've tried to do that when I come down here and speak, and I'm, uh, I'm happy to have the opportunity to restate the facts as they exist, as they have been presented to us by the experts, by the Congressional Budget Office, and by the CMS actuary, both of whom have concluded the same thing when it comes to the benefits and what this is, the impact this is going to have on premiums in this country, which I think is probably the most devastating uh, blow to the argument the other side has made in, in uh, support of this bill when the CMS actuary came out last week and said this is actually going to increase, uh, you know, this is going to increase the cost of health care in this country by $234 billion uh, over the next 10 years. Uh, so, Madam President, I'm happy to yield. I see our, we've, a number of our colleagues are on the floor. The leader uh, is here as well, and I would uh, certainly uh, yield, yield some time to the leader. <coughs> If, if I could, I, uh, Madam President, <clears throat> Senator McCain, I had an opportunity to talk off the floor about things that may be in or out of the uh, current Reed bill that's over there behind closed doors. Things are popping up and being uh, left out and whether or not any of that is significant. And I would say to my friend from Arizona, it doesn't make a whole lot of difference, does it? Because the core of the bill, that which will not change, has not changed in any of these various iterations of Reed we've seen. A half a trillion dollars in cuts in Medicare, $400 billion in new taxes, and higher insurance premiums for every, everyone else. I asked my friend from Arizona, I don't think any of that's going to change. Does, does he? I, I, I just respond by saying whether the public option is in or out or whether expansion of Medicare is in or out, the core of this legislation will do nothing to reduce or eliminate the problem of health care in America, which is the cost of health care, not the quality of health care. In fact, it will, in many ways, impact directly the quality of health care, increase the cost, as we all know, by some $2.5 trillion, according to the chairman of the Finance Committee. And this, this back, but I also want to point out again, this back and forth, this is in, this is out. Well, let's try this. Uh, who up until a week ago ever heard we were going to expand Medicare? Now it's out. Now it's in. What, you know, we usually kind of are used to around here having hearings, proposals, witnesses, and then we shape legislation, which is amended in the committee and then brought to the floor and amended on the floor. Here we have, you know, we have to get news flashes to know whether the public option is in or out, whether Medicare expansion is in or out. Uh, again, this is a kind of a bizarre process, I would ask my friend, but he is right. It doesn't affect the core problem with this legislation, which is that it does not reduce costs and it increases uh, uh, the size and scope of government and the tax burden that Americans will bear for a long period of time, including, by the way, again, I don't mean to sound parochial, there's 337,000 of my citizens in Medicare Advantage program. The other side has admitted the Medicare Advantage program will go by the wayside. That, that's, that, that's affecting a whole lot of people's lives, I would say, and that's in the core of the bill. That will not be changed by expansion of Medicare or public option or no public option. Well, the senator from uh, Arizona, I see a number of our oh, leader. I, I would simply add that um, the, this, this idea of expanding Medicare, which just emerged last week, uh, really was a bad one, and one that even I think a lot of the, the Democrat senators have come out in opposition to, which is why now they're back at the drawing board. But this relentless effort to try and, you know, tweak this thing around the edges to somehow get that 60th vote doesn't do anything to change the fundamental features of the bill, which uh, the leader and the senator from Arizona have been talking about, and that is the tax increases, the spending. Yes, sir, I'd be happy to. You use. know, over the weekend, we... I